So we'll see how this um, how this works. See if the um, microphone picks up decently. Also remember, you've got a uh, a quiz currently open. If we finish everything that we need to finish today, you may actually have another quiz open. But I'm gonna what I would do is I would leave it open basically until the next class period. So it would be open all next week, the beginning of the next week uh, until Tuesday. Now, just to make sure that you understand for the for the quizzes when you when you look at these on. Canvas, your quiz on Canvas, your quiz grades are weighted the same as a test grade. And on the syllabus, that's not the case. That's not even close to the case. Okay, quizzes count six percent each. Tests count, I don't know, twenty-seven percent or something like that. Twenty-six percent. And so, if you don't do great on the um, on the quiz and it shows that it brings your grade down the average on canvas don't pay any attention to that okay because it's, it's simply the weightings aren't correctly and I'm going to drop the lowest quiz grade so I had some students who would contact me and they said hey I took the quiz I didn't do so well and it pulled my grade down a letter grade or two letter grades or whatever um, but that's not actually the case so don't don't panic when you when you see that all right, we are almost there, I promise you. Okay, we left off, I believe, in Chapter 5. And we had just talked about present value. And let's see. Talked about that. present value calculation. We talked about the present value of the lump sum. Uh -huh. okay. This is where I believe we left off. Now, remember, we're talking about time value of money, and we, you, we've talked about future value to this point. Now we're talking about present value. So with present value, what we're doing is we're taking a future sum of cash, and we're bringing it back to today's dollars at a certain what we call discount rate. Uh, the discount rate can be uh, your required rate of return. It can be, if you're, if you're doing this in terms of a corporation, it could be the cost of raising capital. I mean, there's several ways that we can keep the discount rate. And so we calculate the present value of a lump sum. The present value of an annuity works basically the same way. The only difference is you put a payment in. Uh, but I want to talk very quickly about what we call uh, the present value of a perpetuity. And the definition of a perpetuity, you see that it says it's a stream of equal payments that are expected to go on forever. So essentially, it's a annuity that is perpetual it lasts forever now you don't actually use your financial calculator for this this is the formula that we're going to use this is the present value of perpetuity is equal to the payment that you want to receive forever divided by r r is the rate of return that you can earn on your money and this basically takes you through this um, in the example Here's a simple example using some nice round numbers. It says you want to receive a $1,000 payment forever. And so using this knowledge, you know, if you can earn 10% on your money, we can simply plug the numbers in to determine what is the present value of this perpetuity. How much do you need to invest today to create $1,000 per year forever? And so to do this, this is our formula that we just looked at. The payment divided by R. So in this case, the payment we want is 1,000. R is 10%, and it's a decimal in the formula. And so 1,000 divided by 0 0.1, 
equals a present value of $10,000. What this means is if you invest $10,000 today and you can guarantee a 10% rate of return forever, what is 10% of $10,000? thousand dollars. So essentially all you're doing is you're taking the earnings from this ten thousand dollar deposit and that's what you're receiving. You're never touching the principal, the amount that you invested, which is the ten thousand. And so as long as you can earn ten percent and as long as you have ten thousand dollars invested, you're always going to earn one thousand dollars on your investment. Does that make sense? So nothing complicated, nothing technical. And here's an example because some of you actually are beneficiaries of perpetuity. You might not know it, but if you have received a scholarship, you are probably the beneficiary of a perpetuity because universities use perpetuities all the time. Uh, now, the way it works is uh, here's an example. We say you've graduated. You've moved up the ladder pretty quickly. You have been very successful. You're making a lot of money now, and you're just sitting in your office one afternoon thinking, you know, I really enjoyed my days in Murray State. And probably the biggest benefit of my entire Murray State career was taking Dr. Lacewell's finance class. So I want to call Murray State, and I want to create a scholarship in his name. And I really appreciate that, by the way. Okay, thank you for that. And so you call the development office and you say, hey, I want to create a $5,000 scholarship. And we're going to call it the Dr. Steve Lacewell Memorial Scholarship, $5,000 to a worthy student. Okay? And so you have to be dead to have a memorial scholarship. This is 20 years. Okay, let's change the name of the scholarship, okay? <laughs> 20 years from now, I will probably be right here doing this exact same thing. So this is going to be the Dr. Steve Lacewell Excellence in Finance Scholarship. How about that? <laughs> let's take the word memorial the hell out of that scholarship definition, okay? We don't want that. All right, so $5,000. Now, the way this works is at a, a typical university, especially Murray State, when somebody gives the money... Uh, gives the university money, typically the university can't spend that money. They can only spend what the money earns, so the interest or the return that's created by the money. We call that the spendable amount, spendable account. So they don't want people just calling saying, hey, I want to create a scholarship of $5,000 per year, and I will send you a check every year for $5,000 that you can then give to the, the person who has the scholarship. And there are some problems with that. First of all, you know, so whoever's paying the $5,000 per year, they're not going to be here forever. So they may pass away. Uh, they may have financial difficulties. And so it's not really fair to say, hey, you get a scholarship this year, but next year the person who's been funding the scholarship, they're having some financial problems, so we can't give you $5,000 again. So they create what's called a perpetuity. And they're going to use basically a 5%, this is the assumed rate of return, a 5% rate of return on the university's investments. And so they're simply going to say, you want to create a $5,000 payment forever? We're going to have 5,000 divided by 0 0.05, and that's going to be the amount you have to write the check for to create the scholarship. And let's see if I've got that there. Okay, no, I don't. So in doing this, bring this up, we're essentially going to have, for the present value of this perpetuity, the payment that we want to receive, which is 5,000, divided by 0 0.05. And so what is 5,000 divided by 0 0.05? How much? $100,000. So you're going to need to write a check for a cool $100,000 to Murray State University. If they can invest that $100,000 and it earns 5% per year, 5% of $100,000 is the $5,000 
perpetuity payment that we want to receive. Pretty straightforward. Now, the example says that what if, because occasionally the stock market has a, has a stumble. And so in that case, the university has to decrease the assumed rate of return, and they'll typically take it down to 3%. Now, if they have a 3% required return, we have basically the same problem. The only difference is our denominator changes to 0 0.03. And so now we have to write a check for how much? 166,667 dollars? Okay. And somebody explained to me in very simple terms why does this amount get larger? Okay, that's exactly right. In order to create $5,000 per year, if you're only earning 3% on your money, then you have to invest 166667 to create $5,000 for a scholarship per year. So the lower the required return, the higher the present value. But again, this is realistic. We use this every single day, multiple times a day on campus. Okay? So this is some real world application. All right, so. Okay, the next topic, we've talked about this a little bit already. We talked about the future value of a mixed stream of cash flows. And basically I said with that, what you have to do is you have to calculate them one at a time and add them up. When it comes to the present value of a mixed stream, we can actually use our financial calculator and sort of trick it into thinking, um, well, I'll talk a little more about what, what we're doing in a minute, but we can use the cash flow register, the CF key, and we can calculate the present value. Really simple. So it doesn't matter whether we have, you know, two cash flows or 20 cash flows, we can, we can do that. Now, this is what it would look like on the timeline. This is a simple mixed stream of cash flows or an uneven cash flow. So we have 400 occurring at time period one, 300 occurring at time period two, and 250 occurring at time period three. The discount rate is 5%. So one possible way to calculate this is simply to find the present value of each of these. So we would take the 400 back one time period, the time period zero, at a 5% discount rate. We would take the 300 back two time periods at a 5% discount, and the 250 back three time periods. So these are the present values. We would add them up, and it would be 869.02. That's one way. Or... There's the equation, just so you can say you've seen it. Now, I know that this slide goes against any PowerPoint presentation rule you've ever had, okay? When they say create an effective PowerPoint presentation, one, don't overload the slide. I am breaking that rule terribly with this slide. But what I want you to do, this is the step-by-step -step method for inputting your cash flows and calculating the present value of a mixed stream of cash flow. So if you're looking at this, um, I want you to be able to just go through step by step, and that's why it's all crammed onto this one, one slide here. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through this, but if you don't remember what I told you, you can go back and take a look at this slide and follow what we're doing. Okay, so I'm actually gonna take you through this using the financial calculator. All right, so let me get this out of the way. And all right, so we've got our financial calculator here. Now, I'm gonna go through just out of habit once I've cleared the zeros and go through second clear time value of money, second clear work. Now, to do this, this is the present value of a mixed stream of cash flows. I'm gonna use my cash flow register. That is here, the CF key. So if I press the CF key, on some of yours, it's gonna pop up and simply show CF zero equals zero. Mine has negative 42,000, so that's a good reminder here. That once I press this, then I want to clear any old cash flows that are in there. So to do this, I'm just gonna, now I'm not gonna do the entire 
step, I'm just going to press my second key, and then I'm going to press my clear work key in the bottom left-hand corner. And that's going to get rid of the second clear work one time. That's going to get rid of any old cash flow. And the reason this is important, it'll become more apparent later, is because we're going to be putting cash flows in. But let's say that the last problem we worked like this had 10 cash flows. The next one only has four. And so we put our four cash flows in. If we don't keep going and looking for the additional cash flows from the last problem, we don't know they're there, but they are, and they're going to really throw off our answer when we come to the present value. Okay, so what you see now, this is CF0. This is the cash flow that occurs at time period zero. So if you go back and look at the example, what cash flow do we have occur at time period zero? Go back and look at the timeline of the... We had time period zero, one, two, and three. So how much was it? So the cash flow at time period zero initially was zero. We didn't have a cash flow then, okay? So this is set to zero. If yours is not set to zero, you could just press the zero and press the enter key to lock it in. Now we're gonna use our down arrow key. We're gonna press it one time. And you'll see these up and down arrow keys. This tells you you can move around within this function. And essentially, you're just going to come back around to where you started. So you can't mess up. You just, you're just going to come back around. So this is asking for C01, cash flow number one. And for our example, how much was the cash flow at time period one? $400, okay? So we're going to enter 400 So 400 Press the enter key to lock it in. If you don't press the enter key, it's going to go back to zero. Now we're going to press our down arrow key once more. This is F01. This stands for the frequency of cash flow one. Now, the definition of this is how many times in a row does the $400 cash flow occur? And for this one, it occurs one time. That's our default. So typically, it's going to be set to one. If, for example, you you have, you know, the $400 occurs three times in a row, then we could change the frequency of this. Okay, but right now we don't have to. So it's one. If it's not, you just press one, enter. But the default is one. Press our down arrow key again. So you kind of see we're just going to put these cash flows in. Cash flow two was 300. So 300, enter. Press our down arrow key. The frequency is one, so that's correct. Press the down arrow key again. Cash flow number three was 250. So 250, press the enter key to lock it in. Press your down arrow key. And it's going to take you one cash flow into the future, which you see we zeroed them out, so that should be zero. There's no cash flow for it. And then it's going to take you back to where we started. Okay? So what you can do is you can press your up or down arrow key and just go through and make sure all your cash flows are there. Now, once you've got your cash flows entered, the next step is we're going to press the NPV key. It's directly to the right of the cash flow key. NPV. Now, this stands for net present value. And we're actually going to use this a little bit later in the capital budgeting section, but this is not actually a net present value because to have a net present value, you need a cash flow at time for zero. We don't have one. We're just tricking our calculator into thinking it's a net present value. Now, this is asking for the discount rate, and the discount rate, uh, let's see, I forgot what it was, 5%, is that right? I think that's what it was. So, hole number five, press the enter key to lock it in. Now, we're going to press our down arrow key one more time, if I can stop doing that, and it tells us we need to press our compute key to come up with a solution. So the compute key, do what? Oh, wait a minute, let me go back. Okay, cash flows. Now, what I want to show you is if I clear but hit my clear button, but I go back to my class, uh, cash flow key, notice the cash flows are still there because I didn't press the second clear work button. So if you mess up or something, you don't have to go through the entire problem again. So the cash flows are there, NPV, I is 5, down arrow key, compute 869.03. That's the present value. 
And we can do this with three cash flows. We can do this with 10 cash flows. We can do this with 20 cash flows. We just have to keep putting them into the financial calculator. So is everybody, did everybody get 869.02? The BA2 plus? What about my graphing calculator users? You getting there? Is 400, 300, and 250. So if you go to the net present value function, I think what you're doing is you're putting in your cash flows and then you're putting in your discount rate, I think, at the end. Because there should be an NPV function on there. Okay, so questions about. Now, again, this walks you through what we just did. So if you didn't get all of it, you can come back and take a look at this. Um, are there any questions about present value of a mixed stream of cash flow? All right. Then, and again, this, um, what this slide essentially tells us is if you're doing these problems, future value, present value, whatever, by hand, using the formulas, then if you want to solve for anything other than future value or present value, then you have to go in and algebraically solve for the variable that you want. For example, if you know the future value, the present value, and the interest rate, but you want to know the N associated with it, the number of periods, you have to go in and algebraically solve for that. With your financial calculator, you don't have to worry about any of that. You just put in three variables and solve for the fourth, whatever it might be. And so this shows you an example of this. Um, this is solving for interest rates. It says we have, uh, you pay $78.35 for an investment that promises to pay you $100 in five years. What annual rate of return will you earn on this investment? So we have a present value, it's $78.35. We have a future value, it's $100. And we have an N, which is five years. What we don't know is the I slash Y, the interest per year or the rate of return. So to solve for this, this is what we would do. We would go through and clear out our financial calculator. And one thing I want to point out to you, really, really important. If you are entering a present value and a future value, like we have here, typically we're solving for one of those, so we don't, have to, we don't enter it. Here we've got a present value and a future value. The present value has to be entered as a negative number. Because if you don't, your calculator is saying, wait a minute, you know, you're putting in two positive cash flows. You can't do that. And so you're going to get an error five message on your Texas Instruments BA2 Plus. And that's very aggravating for a lot of students because they say, hey, I keep getting this error message. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm following exactly what you've got on the screen. Well, you are, except for you're not making this negative. Okay? And so to show you this, I'll go here. I'm going to go through my second clear time value of money, second clear work. I'm also going to check my payments per year just to make sure they're on one, which they are. Now, I can put in my 78.35. I'm going to make it negative here, okay? Negative, and then press my PV, present value. 100 is my, and it's positive, future value. And 5, is that right? 5 is my N. And we want to compute, in this case, the I slash Y. So the rate of return on this investment is 5% per year. And again, you may think, well, you know, how would you not know that? Or, you know, but again, as long as you have three variables, you can solve for the fourth. And a lot of times this is a very, very helpful function for your calculator. All right, and again, this goes through, we won't go through this, but it's, you can solve for time. So again, if you've got a 
present value and a future value, you can solve for the missing variable. In this case, it's in. And this will walk you through the process of how to do this. And again, notice if you're entering a present value, it has to be negative. And I'll just show you what it looks like if you don't enter your present value as a negative number. It's going to look like this. This is solving for missing interest rates. Yes. Okay. So if you see that, automatically you should think, oh, wait a minute, I have to enter one of those variables as a negative, and almost always it's going to be the present value as a negative cash flow. Okay. Um, we've already talked about this. All right, this is, let's talk about this for just a second. Um, up until this point, when we're talking about present value, future value calculations, we're assuming that we are compounding, remember compounding uh, or discounting, but we're assuming we're compounding interest one time per year or annually. And the reason for that is it just makes things easier. And so when you're learning how to do this initially, that's the best place to start is annual compounding. But in real life, you often have accounts or investments that compound interest more often than annually. It's pretty common, actually. So we need to know how to handle that. How do we, you know, what do we do if we're um, using more frequent than annual compounding? So what we're going to do is, as I said earlier, I think last time we met, we're going to leave this calculator set to either one payment per year or 12 payments per year, nothing else. So if we have semi-annual compounding, which means the interest is compounded two times per year, or quarterly compounding, which means it's compounded four times per year, we're simply going to make the changes manually, enter them into our calculator, and solve it just like we've been doing. So it's not much different than what we've been doing all along. Now, th these are our steps. It says the number of compounding periods per year will be represented by the letter M. And we're going to leave our calculator set to one payment per year, and we're going to divide the interest rate by M. So if we have semi-annual compounding, M would be 2. And we're going to multiply N by M. So what we're doing is we're changing our inputs in this example with semi-annual compounding to six-month increments. Not annual increments anymore, but six-month increments. And we would solve it just like we normally would. So in doing this, here's an example of we have $1,000. We're investing. For five years at a rate of return of 10%. But we're going to assume in this one we, are, we have compounding semi-annually. Now, our inputs are going to look like this for the semi-annual compounding. The present value doesn't change. It stays the same. N, instead of being five years, N is now five times two or ten six-month periods. And then the interest per year, instead of being 10%, is now 10 divided by two or 5% every six months. So we're just changing everything to six-month increments. That's all we're doing. And so we would put in a present value of 1,000, an N of 10, an interest per year of 5, compute future value, whatever that equals. And then if we have quarterly compounding, we're doing the same thing. We're simply multiplying by 4 because interest is compounded 4 times per year and dividing by 4. And so these would be our inputs, 1,000, 20, 2 and a half, and we could go through the calculations. And I will actually go through one of these just to make sure we're doing this right. So, I'll put in 1,000 as my present value. And I'll do the semi-annual compounding. So 10 would be my N. And 5 is 
i slash y. We want to compute the future value. So 1628.89, and then if we did this quarterly, I can run through that really quickly. 20 uh, in, and then 2.5 i slash y compute future value. And what you're going to find is that the future value of the quarterly compounding is larger than the future value of the semi-annual compounding. Now somebody explain to me, why is that? Because what? That's exactly right. You're compounding your interest more frequently, which means you're going to earn more interest. Or this can also work against you because if you're borrowing money in the, in the form of a loan, the more frequent the compounding, the more interest you're going to pay. So if you're faced with two, two bank accounts, two savings accounts, one compounds interest semi-annually, the other compounds interest monthly, you would want to go with the one, if everything else is equal, the one with the more frequent compounding. If you're borrowing money, looking at two different loans, you would want to go with the loan that compounds interest less frequently because you're paying less money. So everybody follow me on this? Yes? All right. All right, let's see. Okay. What we're talking about here, again, we, we've talked about annual compounding and more frequent compounding. There's a couple of different interest rates you need to know the definition of uh, for test purposes. One is called the nominal rate of interest. That says it's the rate written in the contracts, quoted by banks and brokers. We also call this just the contractual rate of interest. The other is the effective rate of interest. And the effective rate of interest is the rate of interest actually paid or earned. Now, another way of thinking of this is the nominal rate of interest does not take into effect compounding or more frequent than annual compounding. The effective rate does take into account the effects of compounding. And so, if it's, this says if we have annual compounding, the nominal rate will always equal the effective rate of interest. There's no difference. But if we have more frequent than annual compounding, then the effective rate is always going to be greater than the nominal rate of interest. Okay? So again, think of the effective rate. That's what you're actually paying or earning on your investment or your loan. And so to do this, we have a formula um, that we could use, but your financial calculator will actually do this. This is the formula. And so now this is actually a, the simple rate. I don't want to confuse you here. The simple rate of interest listed here is actually the nominal rate of interest listed here. Okay? Another name for it is the simple rate of interest. So in this case, if we want to convert the nominal rate of interest to the effective rate, we could plug the numbers into this somewhat nasty looking formula, but it's actually pretty easy. And so to do this, um, let's, we've got one plus the nominal rate divided by M. M is the number of compounding periods per year raised to the mp power, and remember this is the letter M, not the letter N, minus one. And to show you how to do this, we can go here if we have a 10% rate of interest compounded semi-annually, we could plug this information into our formula, which is here. This is what we just looked at. So this would equal 1 plus our 10% simple rate or nominal rate of interest divided by M, since we have semi-annual compounding, M is 2, 2 times per year, raised to the M power minus 1. And what this would tell us is that the effective rate of interest is not 10%. We're actually paying or earning 10.25% because of the effects of compounding. Does that make sense? Kind of what, what we're doing here? Converting from nominal to effective? Now, you can use the formula. That's fine. This will be on your formula sheet for the next test. But your financial calculator will do this also. And if you take a look at your financial calculator, 
right above the number two key, you will see the letters I-C-O-N-V. That stands for interest conversion. So that will do it for you, basically. So if we go back to zeros, press our second key and our number two, it's going to ask for a nominal rate of interest. Now, I would get into the habit when you're doing this also of just pressing your second and clear work button to clear out any old inputs here. Now, in our example, our nominal rate of interest in our example here is 10%. So we're just going to put 10, press the Enter key to lock it in. Now you're going to press, you can either go either way. You can press your up arrow key once or your down arrow key from this position twice. Doesn't really matter. You're going to come back around to the same thing. What you're looking at is looking for on this is the C slash Y, compounding periods per year. This is your M. And so in this case, our M is 2. So 2, press the Enter key. Now you're going to press your up arrow key one time. And it says the effective rate equals, and it tells us we have to press our compute button in the top left-hand corner to get a solution. So the effective rate is 10.25%, which you're paying or earning, based on a nominal rate of 10% compounded semi-annually. And what's going to happen is, and the great thing about this is, you can look at, okay, what if we have quarterly compounding? What if we have monthly or daily compounding? The effective rate is going to keep getting larger and larger and larger. And again, with this, you can just take a look at it and go, okay, what about monthly compounding? The effective rate is now 10.47. What if we have daily compounding, 365 times per year? The effective rate is 10.51. So the more frequent the compounding, the larger the difference between the nominal or simple rate of interest and the effective rate of interest. All right, so we're still good to go. And this walks you through, again, what we just did. So if you're looking at this later and you're like, hey, well, I don't remember what buttons he pushed, go to this slide and it will take you through exactly step by step through the interest conversion process. All right, now this is, um, this is a really, really useful part of the class because we're talking about loans and almost everybody in here is going to borrow money at some point in their life. Some of you already have, maybe with student loans or car loans or uh, maybe you bought a house and most people borrow money to buy a house. We call it a mortgage loan. If you understand the loan process, you can save yourself literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest. So the problem is most people don't understand it. Okay, they just go into a bank and they say, hey, I want to borrow money. And the bank says, that's fine. How much do you want to borrow? We need to run a credit check. And they're going to give you, in terms of your payment, the most expensive loan, the one that you pay the most interest on, because that's how a bank makes money. So I'm a former banker. I've got, I teach at a banking school. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not illegal. They're there to make a profit. Okay. But it's up to you as a consumer to know what's best for you and to understand what's best for you. And so what this is talking about is what we call an amortized loan. It says this is a loan that's repaid in equal payments over its life. Payments can be annually, quarterly, monthly. Uh, most are monthly, such as a car loan. So if you borrow money to purchase a car, let's say you borrow $15,000 for 48 months. You're going to have a monthly payment each month for 48 months or four years of so much per month. It's going to stay the same if it's a fixed rate loan, which most are. But what happens is the portion of that payment that goes to principal, principal is what you borrowed, the 15000 And the portion of each payment that goes to interest, that's what you're paying to use the money's bank. That difference between principal and interest is going to change, although the total payment is going to be the same. Okay? And so that's what this is. This says that of the total payment, a portion goes to interest, 
and a portion goes to principal. And with each payment, a little more goes to principal, which is a good thing for you as a borrower, and a little less goes to interest. And we have something called an amortization table, which we'll take a look at in just a minute. But um, there's uh, lots of online calculators that will show you an amortization schedule, which basically shows with each payment, how much goes to principal, how much goes to interest until the loan is paid off. <clears throat> okay, now, this is how you calculate a loan payment. Very, very important to understand how to do this. The amount that you borrow, which we call the principal, is the present value. The interest rate, I slash Y, the number of payments is the N, and we're computing the payment amount. Now, if this is a monthly payment loan, you need to change your calculator to 12 payments per year. If it's an annual payment loan, you change it to one payment per year. Pretty straightforward. And in our example, <coughs> the first one is, this is an, a really simple annual payment loan, which means you have one payment per year. Okay, so your P slash Y would be set to one. So we're going to borrow $15,000, we're going to pay 8% interest on our loan, and we're going to pay it back in three equal yearly payments, so just one payment per year. And so in this case, well, let me go back here, in this case, if we go here, now again, I'm going through my clear process. I'm going to make sure that my calculator for this example is set on one payment per year. And then we're going to switch over to 12 payments per year in just a minute. So it was 15000 was my PV, present value. Eight is my interest that I'm paying, interest per year, I slash Y. And I have three payments, one per year for three years. So three in and I want to compute the payment amount. So this tells me, so if I pay $5,820.50 per year for three years, I'm gonna pay off the 15,000 that I borrowed plus the interest that accumulated on that loan. So everybody follow me on this? Now, if we want to look at something a little more realistic, such as a car loan payment. Then um, in this example, it says you plan to purchase a $25,000 car. You've got $5,000 in cash for a down payment. The interest rate is 7% per year, and you want to finance the car for four years or in monthly terms, that's four times 12, 48 months. So I want you to calculate your loan payment. So in this case, for our inputs, we're going to have the present value. We're going to borrow 20000 Remember, we're paying 5000 down on the car, 25000 on the car, so we're borrowing twenty. The I slash Y, what did I say, 7%? And N is going to be four years times 12, which is 48 payments. And remember to change your payments per year to 12, because this is a monthly pay loan. Okay, so we want to calculate our loan payment. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go through my clear process pretty quickly. Then I'm going to check my payments per year. It should be 12. Enter. Clear. Now I'm going to have to put my inputs in. It was 20000 as my present value. 7 was my interest per year and 48 in and we want to compute the payment amount 
So you're buying a car, you've picked out your perfect car, your dream car, and you go to the, let's say you go to a car, now my examples here, I may pick on um, car sales people a little bit. Uh, I don't have anything against them, so if you have a family member who's a car salesman or saleswoman or whatever, I mean, I have friends who are in the business too. Um, some of them, I mean, I'll admit, some of them are a little bit shady at times. Some of them are really honest people, okay? So, but again, this helps you make sure you're getting the best deal if you understand this. So let's say you walked onto a car lot, you found your car, you found the right color, it's got the right interior, it's $25,000, and so they price it to you, they calculate the payment, and you say, man, I just, I was wanting to keep my payment around $400 per month. Because most people, when they borrow money for something like a car, a motorcycle, a boat, even a house, they don't ask about the interest rate. They really don't care what interest rate they're paying. What's the one thing they want to know about that or borrowing money for that, whatever it is? How much is my monthly payment? If they can fit that monthly payment into their budget somehow, hello, new motorcycle. Hello, new bass boat, whatever it is. Okay, I mean, that's, that's all they're worried about. When you buy a car, you want to negotiate, first of all, the best price for the car. Because they're going to bring up, they're going to say, hey, what, what do you want your monthly payment to be? That's going to be the first question out of the car salesperson's mouth, or the second question. First might be, what kind of car are you looking for? Second is, how much you want to spend per month? You tell them, don't worry about the monthly payment. We'll worry about that later. I want to find the car that I want, and I want the best price for it. And then we'll worry about the financing options later. So in this case, you found your car, they come back, the payment's 478. You're like, man, I just can't do that. I want a $400 payment. So the salesperson, they're going to disappear. They're going to say, wait a minute, I need to talk to my finance manager. You look like you look like a pretty honest person, okay? And I know you like this car. So I really like to see you drive off in this car today. Let me go talk to my sales manager. I'll be right back. So they disappear. They go pour themselves a cup of coffee, sit there for a few minutes, check out the score of the game on television, and then they come back to you. Man, you are in luck today. I don't typically typically he won't do this, but for you he he did. We can make your payment fit your budget. Four hundred or under. So what we did, we can put you in this car for three hundred and ninety six dollars and two cents per month. Man. We're we're like a miracle worker. Okay? Now, was that a miracle? No. What happened? All I did, I just extended the payments out another year. So we're dividing the payments instead of over four years, we're dividing them over 60 payments, which is five years. But it looks like magic to most people. Did the car get cheaper? No. Did the interest rate get cheaper? Actually, the interest rate may be a little more expensive because you're borrowing money for a longer period of time. I, I didn't do that here, but that a lot of times happens in real life. All we're doing is spreading out the payments longer. And today, it's not unusual. If you want to buy a car, you can finance a car for 60 months, which is five years. You can finance it for 72 months, which is six years. You can even finance some cars up to 84 months. That is seven years of car payments. Let me give you some really important advice, okay? And listen really well, even anybody who's asleep, listen really well, okay? If you buy a car and you finance it, never, ever, ever finance your car for more than 60 months. That's five years. I don't care what the dealer says. 
I don't care how much you like the car. I don't care how cool it is. I don't care what kind of stereo system or other electronics it has in it or the nice leather interior with white piping around the trim or whatever. Because a car is a depreciating asset. It's going down in value, and it's going down in value really fast. And what happens is if you finance a car, typically from and actually less than 60 months is better. 48 is better, 48 months. If you finance a car for less, or excuse me, more than 60 months, what happens is the value of the car goes down faster than the value of your loan, the remaining balance. And so I understand cars, okay? I love cars. I like boats. I like ATVs. I like motorcycles. I like campers. I like all these toys that most people borrow money for. I either own them now or I have owned them in the past. So I understand that. I understand the, the draw. Right now, it's motorcycle time. You're going to see people hitting the motorcycle shops because the weather's getting nice, and they're going to be buying boats to go fishing. Okay. But when you're buying these items, especially if you buy a new one, they drop in value really fast. A new car loses about 20, 15 to 20 percent of its value the second you drive it off the lot. That's why. And then this is a personal preference. I'm not saying new cars are bad or wrong, okay? But me personally, I have never owned a brand new car. Can I afford a brand new car? Yes, I can. Can I pay cash right now for a brand new car? Yeah, I can. Why won't I buy a brand new car? It, in my opinion... It's money that I can spend somewhere else. It's not like I don't spend money. Believe me, I spend a lot of money on stuff. It's just if I buy a car that's two years old or three years old and save $10,000 or $15,000, then I can put that money on a boat or a motorcycle or something else. But again, it's personal preference. Some people like new cars. They like the smell of a new car. That's, and they trade every single year. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. You just have to determine how do you want to spend your money. Well, it drives my wife crazy. She's like, one time in your life, buy a new car. Just one time. Everybody needs to experience that. And I might. You know, if I make it to 80, then I might buy a new car. I might buy a brand new Corvette when I'm 80. Just to piss off all the young people. <laughs> That you drive around and you see them and they're like, man, only old people can afford new Corvettes. If I see an old man driving a new car, I'm always sort of excited. I'm like, they work for that. That's right. See, <laughs> I, that's right. I work for it. Yeah. And, I'm, and when I drive that Corvette off the lot, I know it's going down a lot in value. It's going to hurt. But I'm probably thinking, okay, I'm 80. What does it matter, okay? It's, it's not a big deal. <laughs> that's, that's true. I'm buying, buying a new car. So anyway, that's kind of how car financing works. So if they're going to lower the payment for you, Something has to change. Either the number of payments has to increase, the interest rate has to go down, or the price has to go down. One of those three or a combination have to change. And in this case, it's not magic. We've just spread out the payments. Okay? So buying a car it can be a pretty tricky process. Um, you know, people talk about trying not to get excited. And again, when I go car shopping, oh my gosh, when I take my wife car shopping, and we go to, first of all, I don't actually like buying cars from car dealers, if I can help it. I'd rather buy a car under warranty from an individual because the dealer has to make a profit, okay? And if it's under warranty, I don't care whether it's individually owned or from a dealer. I'd rather cut out the profit, save me that money, and buy from an individual. But again, that's just, that's just me. But when you go to a car dealer, they want you excited about that car. And they don't want you leaving the car lot unless you're driving off in that new car. Okay? But that's, they're, just, they're there to sell you a car. That's what they're there for. And so one thing you try to do is you try to remain calm. You're looking at a car, and you're like, yeah, that's inside. You're going crazy. You're like, oh, my gosh, that's the nicest car I've ever seen. It's just what I'm looking for. But on the outside, you're supposed to say calm. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty nice car. I, color's not really what I'm looking for, but 
I'll, I'll talk to you about price and we'll see if we can come to a, an agreement. And so I'm all cool and everything. And my wife's over here and she's <laughs> jumping up and down and punching me on the arm and pointing at the car. And I'm like, go somewhere else. Go back, in the, go back inside and get a cup of coffee or something like she needs more caffeine or whatever. But I'm like, Cal just calm down. So if you have somebody like that, you need to either get their input beforehand and then have them out of the picture because the car sales person, they're going, yeah, I've got this in the bag, okay? If she wants it, he's going to buy it, okay? That's just kind of how, how they view it. So, again, buying a car can be a tricky process. Now, I will tell you that if, you, um, if you're going to go car shopping, one thing that I would, and I do this. I mean, I, I'll go to a car lot. So with my phone, I don't have to do it as much today because they've got financial calculators on your phone. But lots of times, I'll go to a car lot, and I'm walking around, and we're talking price. And if somebody's going to kind of throw something in on the, on the price of a car, but you're spreading it out over 60 payments or 48 payments, then it's easy to get away with it. Okay, we're going to put in a documentation fee of $200 or whatever, new floor mats. We're going to charge you $400 for them. Now, if they came out and just said we're charging $400 for floor mats, you might be like, whoa, wait a minute. No, I don't, I don't want those. I'll, I'll go to Walmart and buy my own floor mats. But if they spread that $400 out over 60 payments, you don't really notice it. So when you're going to a car lot and you're calculating, okay, what, you know, what's my payment going to be, first of all, if they see that you have a financial calculator in your hand, they're going to think, man, this person, they really know what they're doing. I better not screw with them, okay? They, I can't throw in any of that stuff. Even if you forget how to use your financial calculator, if you walk around and you just look like you're punching buttons, <laughs> even if the batteries are dead, Seriously, they're going to go, whoa, that's, this person's pretty smart, I'm, you know. And so negotiate the price first, then negotiate the best financing deal. Now, a lot of times the best thing you can do is simply pay cash for it. Some people say, what if I get 0% interest? Then what do I do? Then that's a little bit different, okay? But if you've got a 7 or 8 or 9% car loan and you can pay cash for it instead, that's the best way to buy a car. But again, cars are expensive. That's really tough, especially initially when you get started. And so, you know, you have to a lot of times borrow money to buy a car. Um, I will say that after a certain amount of time, you, if you get to the point where you can pay cash, life gets a lot better. Now, you might not be driving new cars, but you don't have to worry about a car payment every month. Okay? And that's one of the big benefits that I've noticed over the last, I don't know, 10 years probably. It's probably been 10 years since I've had a car payment. Because what I do is I buy used cars. Now, some of them are nicer than others. I um, mean, for a long time, and I still drive it occasionally, um, I drive my truck, I drove a silver Dodge truck. It had, right now, I still own it. It's got 245,000 miles on it. It's got a big dent in the back of it. But it, it was perfect for me because I could drive it hunting or fishing. I could throw something in the bed of it. I could drive it where I wanted to. If I had to run over something, I could. You know, it didn't matter. If it got scratched up, I'm not going to, you know, get all upset about it like it was a $60,000 truck. But the greatest thing about that truck wasn't the interior. It wasn't the, you know, the size of it or the motor. It was that it was paid for. I paid cash for it. Drove it for a long time, still on it, and that's the best thing about that car. I'm in the position, not very enviable position, but position right now of owning five cars, okay? Two of those are kids' vehicles. They're not all brand new, but they're all paid for. And that makes a big difference each month whenever you get paid and you're like, okay, how do I come up with the car payment? How do I come up with this or that or whatever, okay? Now, you can do the same thing with a house payment. This is, you know, a mortgage loan. This is a $200,000 house. Typically with a house, you're going to have a 20% down payment. The interest rate 
you know, right now we've got historically low interest rates, and typically most houses are financed for either 30 years or 15 years. And so in doing this, let's say you, you're going to buy this $200,000 house, 20% down payment. Uh, what's 20% of 200000 $40,000, so you're paying $40,000 down, you're going to finance the rest, $160,000. 200 minus 40, 160. So, with our calculator, now again, this is a monthly payment, okay? So we need to be set on 12 payments per year. So, 160 is the present value. If we're going to finance it for 30 years, 12 months per year times 30 is 360 monthly payments. So N is going to be 360. And then our interest rate, it says here, is going to be 5%. And again, house in, you know, interest rates, they're really low right now. It's a great time to buy a house. They're not always going to be that low. Now we'll to compute my payment amount. In my payment, what we call P&I, principal and interest, is going to be eight fifty eight ninety one per month. For 30 years. If this is a fixed rate loan, this payment amount's not going to change. Every month, you're going to write a check or it's going to automatically be drafted out of your account, 858.91. Month one, month two, month three, month 200, month 300, month 360, and your house is paid for. Now, what you can do is with this, I said you can, um, there's an amortization schedule. We have one actually on our calculator, which is right here, it's right above the present value key. So if you calculate a loan payment, and then, I'll bring this back up in just a minute, and then you want to calculate an amortization schedule, this is what one would look like. So what it shows you is the loan balance, the payment amount, how much of each payment goes to principal, or excuse me, goes to interest, and how much of each payment goes to principal. Because if we add this number and this number, it's always going to equal the payment amount. And then it shows you how much you owe after you've made, in this case, the first payment, the second payment, and then after the third payment, it should be zero. It's off a little bit due to rounding. So in your financial calculator, once you've calculated the loan payment, what you're showing this, we can press our second and our present value key. And what you're going to see here is P1, and if you press your down arrow key, it's going to say P2. Now. The P stands for payment or period. It doesn't matter. They mean the same thing. They work the same way. But the way this works is if you're interested in a single payment, whether it's payment 1, payment 28, payment 36, whatever, you want to know how much goes to principal and how much goes to interest with just that payment, you set P1 and P2 equal to that payment number. So in this case, let's say, for example, we want to know about payment number 1. We would set P1 equal to 1. If it's not there, you just hit press 1 and enter. And you press your down arrow key. We're going to set P2 equal to 1. And then press the enter key. Now, if you press your down arrow key, it's going to show you after you've made the first payment of whatever it was, 800 and some odd dollars per month, you owe 159,807. Out of that payment amount, 192,25 goes to principal. That's how much you borrow, so it's paying down the loan. And 66667 goes to interest. Let me show you this again. Principal, interest. Most of your payment on a house early in the life of the loan goes to interest. Not much is paid on the principal. We can take a look at the first 12 payments. We can set, when we're looking at a series of payments, we set P1 equal to the beginning of the series. P2 equal to the end of the series. So after the first year, we can set P1 equal to 1. We'll set P2 equal to 12. Enter. And then if we press our down arrow key, after 12 payments, we've been paying for a year. We owe 157,639. We paid 2360 in principal, and we have paid 7,946 in interest. And again, I see some of you shaking your head, and that's what a lot of people do when they see this. You know, this is not illegal. A lot of people see this, and they think the bank's cheating them somehow. Okay? It's not. It's just the way an amortizing loan works. Because when you first bought the house, you had $160,000 of the bank's money. And since you had more of their money, you have to pay more interest. But with each payment, you pay 
a little bit down on the principal, so you have less of the bank's money. So of your 800 and whatever dollar payment, more goes to principal, less goes to interest, but it's a slow process, okay? You know, you can look at the first 15 years of a house payment. A lot of people think if I finance it for, for um, 30 years, after 15 years, I should be uh, half finished. But notice, you borrowed 160, half of that would be 80,000. But after 15 years, you still owe $108,000. After 15 years of payments, you paid 51385 in principal. You paid 103218 in interest. And then after, if we want to go to the end of the loan payment, 360 as our, the so one to 360, the house is paid for. You paid $160,000 for the house, and you have paid roughly $50,000 in interest. Okay? Now, again, we could go through the process because we're running out of time here, but, you know, you could finance the same house for 15 years. Your payment's going to be just a little bit more per month, but you're going to save thousands of dollars in interest by just financing the house for 15 years versus 30 years fixed straight, okay? And then, let's see, that's basically it. You can kind of go through this. This will walk you through the amortization schedule that we just talked about. This will take you through the 15 versus the 30 year mortgage. This is a growth rate calculation. The one thing I want to point out here is, um, this is your starting amount and your ending amount. The number of growth periods is going to be your end. So in this case, that's not the number of years, it's the number of growth periods. So 2007, 2008 is one growth period. 08 to 09 is one growth period. So your N is going to be four and not five. And then finally, the end of chapter five. Now, first of all, have a great spring break. Okay? If you're going somewhere, have fun, use some common sense, be safe, make it back here in one piece. Um, if you're going car shopping, okay, use some of the, or motorcycle shopping or boat shopping, use some of the things that we talked about here today. I'm going to post a quiz probably later this afternoon or maybe tomorrow. It's going to cover the entire chapter five, okay? It's going to be a 10-question quiz, but the second quiz, you can take it two times with your highest score counting, Okay? I'm going to open it up now. I'm going to leave it open all through spring break. I'm going to leave it open until our next class, the Tuesday after spring break. So if you don't want to fool with it right now, that's fine. Okay? Just be sure to take it for the Tuesday after spring break. When we come back, and we're going to start into Chapter 8 when you come back. Okay? Have a great spring break. Be careful. Be safe. And I will see you back here after spring break. That's right.